Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. This program is sponsored by Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island, which offers innovative and compassionate care up on Rolling Bay. They also have day stay and respite programs. To learn more, jot down this number, 360-689-4314. Also, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people, specifically our neighbors, the Suquamish tribe. We are grateful for their hospitality and we honor them. And today on uh, something to talk about, we're gonna be talking about the Bainbridge Island School District. And we have uh, a couple of members of the School District Board of Directors, Christina Hewlett and Lynn Smith with us today. Welcome ladies. Hello, thank you. And uh, I thought that we might just start with uh, you giving a little presentation of what kinds of things are uh, top of mind at our uh, local public school district, and then we can open it up for more discussion and questions as we go. Sounds good, can you see that? Yes, that's beautiful. All right. Lynn, do you wanna start? Um, I could start. Hi, my name is Lynn Smith. I am on the um, Bainbridge Island School Board. And I just wanted to thank you, um, uh, Bainbridge Senior Community Center, for having us today. And Reed, thank you so much for being such a good um, person to, to um, help us through this presentation. <laughs> um, we are really trying hard to um, create relationships within our community. And we thought that the senior community was a great place for us to, to be. I think we have a lot of places where we can partnership and, um, and help each other out. So it sounds like we do a little bit of that already. Um, so we have a presentation that has a lot of information in it. We're not gonna like cover every word on every slide, but we thought that you'd wanna have access to that. So if there are any questions in the middle, just feel free to like raise your hand or pop in with a question. We're happy to answer them. Thank you, add Christina. Hi, and I'm Christina Hewlett. I'm also a member of the school board. So nice to have, nice to be here. <laughs> All right, so our first slide is full of information. Um, I'm not going to read through it, but I thought that this was a good opportunity to talk about a few of the points that Reed had brought up in his email about um, things that we cover, which was mostly strengths and challenges of um, that our district is facing today. Um, we have declining enrollment right now. We have 3,500 students, and it's down about 600 students over the last, what, 10 10 years, six to 10 years. So um, our, our classes, our schools are getting smaller and um, that's part due to affordable housing. Part of it is due to just changes in our demographics here on the island. And I think that's a place where our communities can get together and problem solve because with declining enrollment comes this declining amount of funding that we get from the state. So that's probably our one of our biggest challenges we have right now. Um, we also have really great teachers, as you'll see, um, you know, our teaching staff has 15 plus years of experience and 80% of our teachers hold master's degrees, which makes them um, more valuable. And so they we pay them appropriately because they're wonderful teachers and they do great things for our kids, but the state does not also does not pay for the experience of the staff that just pays for a teacher. So that's another big funding sort of gap that we have that we'll talk about later. Um, I think that's kind of the big, that's a big picture. You'll see as we go through that all the, the strengths and challenges are kind of woven through each slide. So um, I'm gonna have Christina walk you through um, how we base our process, our processes on um, like how we did our, our district improvement plan and things like that. She's gonna walk you through how we did that and how our strong community values shine in that document and how they, they guide us in how we educate our children. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so back in 2020, uh, the district adopted a new mission statement and a strategic plan, which is what we call our district improvement plan. And um, this really came from our community. We had a very in-depth community effort over, um, over a year um, to uh, help us think this through. And I won't read the whole mission statement. You can find it also on our website. But um, some highlights here include 
wanting to really focus on the, the skills and talents and passions of our students, provide a very welcoming, respectful environment where kids have a strong sense of belonging, that we have engaging, relevant, challenging curriculum that prepares them, and ultimately help, help support our students to find their purpose and contribute in whatever it is that they want to do um, in, in their lives. And we also had a lot of conversations as a community, as a board, as a, as a staff, about some core belief statements um, around you know, believing in every child, believing that our academics, the social and emotional health of our students is as important as our academics, that we va value diversity, that we believe relationships are key, community work is key. And so you'll see these themes um, in the next couple of slides about how then we are trying to um, bring this mission statement to life and have it actually um, show up in our classrooms with our, with our students. So that first belief statement that I mentioned, we believe in every child, what we mean by that is that we have high expectations and hopes for all of our students, that we want all of our students to have an opportunity to thrive, to get the skills, the knowledge, the um, confidence that they need to be successful, again, in whatever path they choose. So some may go to a two or four year college, they may be enrolled, they may be employed and get a job, they may go into, they may be enlisted and, and go into the military, whatever path our students choose, we want to make sure that our our, our classes, our culture, our, um, our learning environment within the school supports them in doing that. And so, as Lynn mentioned, um, there we have our district improvement plan, which is our word for a strategic plan um, that, as I mentioned, was created with this um, with our community. And um, just to be clear, it wasn't Lynn or myself or our superintendent in a room somewhere. Uh, we had hundreds of people <laughs> um, over a uh, uh, over over a year, help us develop this, um, and it included students and teachers, staff, parents, community members, a lot of local organizations like Rotary and um, Bainbridge Youth Services, Helpline House, a whole whole slew of folks who helped us think through. Okay, what should we then be focusing on to really improve what we offer um, as a school system? And so that those groups, those individuals, um, this whole community process identified three areas of focus, teaching and learning, equity, and the health and well-being of our students. Um, and um, those three areas have specific priorities and goals under each of them. And you can find the detailed plan online, but Lynn and I will hit some of the highlights here. And the thing I just want to emphasize is these three areas have proven to be incredibly relevant during COVID and as we come through COVID. Um, and so um, let me talk a little bit, we'll, we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail about each of those, starting with the teaching and learning section. Lynn? All right. So the first pillar of our DIP is teaching and learning, and it's essentially a promise by our district to each and every one of our students to serve them where they are and prepare them for the world that they will inherit. Um, we really want to give them challenging curriculum, um, relevant curriculum, and we want them to be in charge of their in, of their learning. Um, it just give, empowers them to be interested in what they're doing. Um, um, we do a lot of project-based learning, which you know it involves big projects where they work in groups, which we would do in any sort of corporate setting or any military setting or any other. It's teaching them to how how to really be a part of the world when they graduate from our school district. Um, we we cover more of this later, and so uh, you can see you know some of our priorities on here. Uh, but it's this huge undertaking that we're doing. Um, Christina will talk about it a little bit later. It's called MTSS, which is Multi-Tiered Systems of Support, which is a, a system. It's, I guess it's a systemic way of, of, of teaching to every single child. So it, it's hard to explain in just like one sentence. So I'm sure Christina will um, explain it a little better than I do right now. But it, our whole goal is to just prepare our students to be able to enter the world as good citizens and able to thrive. I just, I will just jump in here and say that last sentence there about being good citizens and being able to thrive sounds like something that's been true of our school system and public education in this country forever. Yeah. Um, but it sounds a little different here in the 21st century than it might have uh, when some of us were going to school ourselves. 
it's definitely a different experience going to school now than it was when we were going to school. Um, and I, I have to admit that it's probably a lot better now too. <laughs> So the teaching and learning is one of the three pillars. Um, and as we mentioned before, there's a lot more detail under each of these um, sub bullets uh, in on the district's website and in the full plan. But that gives you a sense of the kinds of things we're focused on on that in the teaching and learning area. That ties a lot to the second area around equity, anti-racism, inclusion, diversity, and justice. And I guess the way I would frame this at a high level is this is ultimately about belonging and ensuring that all of our students can thrive on our watch. Um, we as a community care deeply about all of our kids. I think we, we all believe in every child. We believe that Bainbridge can be a place where any student can thrive, no matter their race, income, their gender, their identity, their religion, sexual orientation, and so forth. And that that is at our core who we are as a community and it's a shared value. We also know, I think as parents and as grandparents that one size doesn't fit all, right? And so what one student might need may be different than another student. And they each, you know, all of us, all of our students face different challenges or need different supports. And so I look at this focus around equity as mean as being that we as a school district are very proactive in looking at all aspects of our district from our budget to our policies, to how and what we teach, to the programs we offer, to the outcomes that we have. We look at all of that and we ask ourselves, okay, what can we do to improve? And is what we're offering working better for some students than others? Um, are there some barriers that we can remove? Are there some different supports we can provide? What changes can we make in what we offer in the kind of culture and the community that we have within our buildings so that all of our students can thrive? And that that kind of focus serves every one of our kids um, and is an important part of what we're, we're really trying to focus on. And we'll give you some specific examples here in a moment, but you can see this the, in the bullet points here that it's, a, that it's really about both diversifying our curriculum, our workforce, making sure students can see themselves and others in what we offer. It's about creating a, a community of belonging. It's, a, it's about being very proactive in our operations so that we, we improve the outcomes for all kids. And I just would like to add that one of the things that I've found in conversations around um, race and culture on the island is that our population is increasingly diverse, especially in the schools. So even if you might have uh, lived here for many years and might have the impression that, uh, you know, this is uh, a community that's as white as Wonder Bread, it's really a lot more complicated and uh, wonderful than that. Absolutely. And Reed, I'm glad you brought that up because 23% of our students are students of color. We have about 10% of our students that are on the free and reduced lunch programs. We have students of all walks of life. And, um, and it's been very, um, you know, we also see this as curriculum that is and a, and a focus that is um, that serves all of our students, right? My, my two sons, as well as, as, as others. And um, and it's a um, it's been very enriching to for I think for Lynn and I to be part of the process trying to think through how we can make this meaningful for our yeah. students in, in the classroom. And it is also very much connected to the third pillar that Lynn is going to talk about. Our well-being and safety, which is the third pillar. Um, I think this is particularly relevant, even though we wrote it before COVID, this is definitely relevant post COVID. We've really worked hard on fostering a sense of belonging. Um, and through belonging, it means that, you know, you're, they, these kids have been through a trauma and they, and so of like a pandemic remote school, um, we feel that um, developing those social emotional skills, those soft skills that, um, that they're going to, that they learn how to relate with each other. And I think that, again, is another one of those skills that going forward will serve them for the rest of their lives. Um, so the belonging is, it's just, it's the, it, showing, feeling the sense of belonging, sorry, I'm getting it all mixed up, um, is, uh, it will help them to learn. It, you know, when you're in a safe place, you're more open to ideas, you're more open to learning, you're more, um, open to speaking your mind. And so this is one of the, you know, having, feeling safe, feeling healthy are, are very important to the education. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about how does all this show up in the classroom? <laughs> um, what does that actually look like? Um, and so I'm going to start with curriculum that we have um, been very um, focused on strengthening what we offer in terms of our curriculum. And we've been intentional about adopting new curriculum that um, is stronger academically from a research-based perspective, whether in reading, writing, math, science, and so on. Um, a curriculum that has diverse representation so that students can see themselves um, and others reflected to back to them. A curriculum that is also very relevant and engaging and kind of meets students where they're at and can be tailored to their individual needs. And so, um, so here are some examples of the elementary and the middle school grade levels. Um, we adopted new math curriculum through eighth grade, and um, we did it for a number of reasons, one of which was there was much more real life problem solving in this math versus the more rote memorization we may be familiar with when we were growing up. Um, this program also tailors math problems so that the same lesson can really support a student who is, let's say, in our highly capable program, as well as a student who might be struggling in math. Um, there is also, from an equity perspective, many more ways to access this material. So um, it, so it works better for students who may, for example, have dyslexia or visual impairments or need some audio support or um, need the material in different languages. So that was um, one area that we uh, have strengthened here around our curriculum. The other one is around science education for grades six through eight there on the right hand side. And we adopted that for many of the same reasons. Um, more real world application. Um, students are having to actually really practice the scientific method. Um, <laughs> it's not a textbook, like one book, like we may have been used to, but brings in a lot of material from different places. And we've had some of, uh, one of our teachers who, um, who, who uses this curriculum shared at a school board meeting that um, has found that there's much, much higher levels of engagement from our students um, from, from that curriculum, which has been fun to see. And then, um, on the bottom there for wit and wisdom, that's new curriculum that we adopted this past year for grades three through five. There too, it's not one textbook, but it's a whole package of very rich materials. I think there's over 40 books. There's 70 different short stories and films and videos. There's, um, it also brings in a lot of um, works of art and poems and so forth. Um, so it's really, really rich, very engaging, very relevant, very inclusive, has a lot of diverse representation in that book. Um, Sheila, I see that your hand is up. Yeah, I just wondered if you could give an example or example, a couple examples of what you do in the science open sci ed uh, program, because that's always been my interest when I was doing teaching. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I'm not, I'm not an expert in, in the, detail, <laughs> the full details of that curriculum, but um, some of the examples that we heard were, um, for example, students were not are not given a set of theories around a particular concept, but had to kind of start with what are the questions, what is the hypothesis that you want to test, and build out the actual content um, in a guided way. The other piece that really stood out to me is that it was less about the teacher presenting a lot of data on the front end and having students kind of being passive recipients of that data, but having to make the experiments themselves and create it and then come to, okay, what is the underlying theory or, um, or scientific um, exploration that, that, you know, that, that they need to understand um, as part of the core curriculum. So those are some of the things that I thought were really engaging. Yeah, I also think that it's interesting that in our current world, we, we have access to a lot more information, uh, internet and uh, uh, social media and texting and so forth, that we have to do a lot more problem solving and we don't necessarily need to remember all of the yeah. facts. The facts yeah. are, are findable if we know how to look at them. And of course, the other question is how to discern the facts from the fake facts or- Right, right. Yeah, if we teach that too. <laughs> um, I did, if, if I can jump in, Christina, can I just yeah, read please. a little bit of the, um, we get an email every week from the superintendent from Peter, um, just uh, sort of giving us an update of what he's been doing. And we got one last Friday and the, the subject was the district improvement plan in action. And I'm just gonna read it, just take a minute. Um, yesterday, we had a successful learning walk at Commodore Options. We visited elementary, middle and high school classrooms. I was especially impressed by the implementation of board approved wit and wisdom curriculum, curriculum below are a few highlights. 
High student engagement. Students were working independently or in small groups on writing related to text. Second and third graders were writing a research paper on their Chromebooks about the giant squid. They were using graphic organizers to develop their essays, were inspired by the essential question of why do ex people explore the sea? Um, proud third grade students in a different class were doing an extension project on the same topic. They were interested in researching the trash in the seas and the impact on wildlife. They showed me their presentation and discussed how they were going to raise funds to support a nonprofit that cleans the oceans of garbage. Um, and there's a link to the dip here that says um, students will develop transferable 21st century skills of critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. Um, and there was, it's evident also in the wit and wisdom of fifth and sixth grade materials where students were researching and writing about nest purse origin stories in context of the cultures and conflicts unit where they are studying Native American and US government perspectives on land, culture, et cetera. Um, thanks for working as board members. We're proud of the great work we do from Peter. I just thought that was really relevant to our discussion today. So thanks for um, allowing me to read that. No, that's uh, insightful. And I think that's the kind of thing that as we, uh, if we aren't directly related to the schools, if we don't get the emails as parents, mm -hmm. uh, we might not get that kind of insight. Yeah. Can I just say that I wish I was in school now? <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> the other thing I'll just highlight here before moving on is, as you may recall, in our district improvement plan, we talked about wanting to kind of to very much honor and elevate the diversity of our own community. And so um, there's a couple items here highlighted. There's others in the curriculum. But for Washington State history in eighth grade, for example, the school board just adopted um, Honoring Thy Mother, which is a local documentary about our Bainbridge Island indigenous women. Um, I, it's been available um, uh, in a couple different community forums. And if you haven't seen it, I would highly recommend. It is a beautiful, engaging, challenging, thoughtful documentary that speaks to our own community. Um, and our own history here. Likewise, um, we've had for many years the Leaving Our Island curriculum um, at Sakai, um, which is about our local, local Japanese Americans um, who were sent to the, Washington, the World War II concentration camps and what that experience is like for our local community members here. And I think both of those speak to belonging. They both lead to very rich conversations with our students about racism, about history, about what does community mean, what does that look like? Um, so it's been it's been um, very moving to see in action the impact that those this type of curriculum is having for our students. Yes, I grew up in this state, and my recollection of Washington State history is not anywhere near as rich of an of, of an exploration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what what I love about these two I also have to add is one thing to that because I I loved history, but um, my my history back in <laughs> In the 40s and the 50s uh, had nothing to say, nothing to say about the Japanese American mm -hmm. or the, uh, the mm -hmm. concentration camps, nor when I was in college, uh, which was a very fine college, um, I never heard about it. I asked my brother about it, who was a history buff. He knew nothing about it. And he was 10 years older than me. So you could, you could see, finally, people are hearing about other things, which is good, this kind of thing. Yeah, really, really important. And I think it, um, you know, it, it was also very powerful to listen to local community members who grew up here on Bainbridge um, and, and what their experience was like of, 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 of being here um, on Bainbridge, of having, of, of having these different experiences um, and how that still is relevant today. <laughs> um, and, um, and in conversations with our students and staff, because we also, for example, with the Honoring Thy Mother had a, several forms that included staff um, to really talk about, okay, how does, how does racism, how does our history, how does community, um, what does that mean to us here? How are we impacted by that? And how does that inform how we teach and educate our students? So what you have here is just a sampling of curriculum that we've adopted that are that mostly at the elementary and middle school levels. Let me talk a little bit about how this shows up at the secondary kind of middle school and high school levels. So there's a lot on this slide. I'm not asking you to read the whole thing, but here's just a sampling of books that our school board has adopted in recent years. And we've adopted these, these books and others to help students really think 
critically and understand um, the issues of our time and issues that they are experiencing firsthand. Um, these are books that represent diverse voices, perspectives, and lived experiences, and comes back to this concept that I mentioned before about windows and mirrors, that students, we want students to be able to see themselves and others reflected in the curriculum. So, um, you know, I won't go through each book, but you'll notice that there's a diversity of authors and books here that speak to, for example, uh, differences around socioeconomics. So Hillbilly Elegy, Educated, The Glass Castle are all examples of that. Books that speak to race, um, like Ghost Boys, uh, Between the World and Me, Stamped. There are books here that touch on um, sexual orientation and identity, like the 57 bus, on religion, like Viktor Frankl's in, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. There's books here that offer very different perspectives from a, from a global perspective and around immigration. So I'm looking at um, like Strength in What Remains, uh, Refugee, Book of Unknown Americans, Spare Parts. Um, so there's a lot of rich material here. Um, and the text on the left is just an example of how our teachers might approach this kind of work. So this is an American dream unit that is at the 11th grade honors class for American studies. So this is a very advanced class. Um, and students read a classic, um, The Great Gatsby. And then they are asked to choose among a group of other books, such as Between the World and Me, Americana, The Book of Unknown Americans, some of the ones that you see here. And then the teachers kind of walk them through conversations and grappling with questions such as, how might one's race, or gender or class impact the experience of the American dream. And I think that's a really powerful example of how our teachers bring their professional expertise and skills to the classroom to engage students in conversations that are very relevant, that are challenging, and that, are also, that also speak to what many of them are either seeing around them in the world or experiencing themselves. Any additional thoughts or questions on kind of how uh, around our curriculum before I, I move on? What a marvelous group of books. <laughs> wow. <laughs> There's it's some on there that are just list. amazing. Yeah. And I'm so glad you've got the giver in there. That's that's really interesting. Yep. And there's a lot more books than this. We just wanted to share with you an example, kind of so you can get a sense of what we, when we say we're implementing this district improvement plan, what does that really look like? What does that mean? Um, and yeah, well, um, whenever you put coats in there, I'll be happy too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, we get we get asked a lot if we're getting rid of classic books um, in order to make room for these books, and oftentimes these books are taught in conjunction with a classic book of of comparing <laughs> ideas, contrasting ideas, seeing how you know where we've come as a society. So it's you know it's this is th these books are not brought on to the detriment of other books. It's, these are in addition to others. So I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, and I, I also think that probably if uh, my recollection of my own education is any guide, um, the critical thinking about these things and questioning the uh, the authors and their point of view and uh, and and any um, any kind of um, uh, narrator bias is going to be part of the discussion with the teachers. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've talked a, a little bit about um, you know, our curriculum, but I also just wanna emphasize it's not just about what we teach, but it's about how we support our students, right? Our district improvement plan is all of that. And so the next thing we're gonna, that Lynn and I are gonna um, speak to a bit here is um, something that, that she mentioned called multi-tiered systems of support. And I apologize, that is a very bureaucratic name. It comes from the state. <laughs> it's a requirement <laughs> of the state. Um, but it ties to one of our core beliefs in the mission statement that I mentioned, and that is that we care as much about the health and well-being of our students as we do their academics. And so we are in the midst as a district um, of implementing a very significant, very intensive um, system-wide initiative called mul this multi-tiered systems of support. And the way I would summarize it, it's about how do we get the right supports to the right kids at the right time? And it's focusing on all of our students. That is, we're not just trying to identify which students need help, but rather what does each student need? Like what help does each student need? And so the circle 
that you see around here um, are, you know, all the things, looking at the whole child, what, what, what are the range of needs that a student may have from mental and behavioral health to their academics to um, their basic needs, right? And then tailoring and designing our services in partnership with community groups and families to meet, better meet those needs. And, you know, as we mentioned at the beginning, this is particularly relevant <laughs> given all we've been through through COVID, right? Um, the, the triangle here is, um, this is trying to explain um, this multi-tiered system of support at a very high level. So I want you to imagine, you know, the universal, the base of the pyramid is kind of the tier one. And that is, you know, what is it that we offer as a district that all of our students get? So that would include the, all the strong curriculum we just went over. It would include other new curriculum that we're in the process of reviewing, like um, social emotional health curriculum. It would include our focus, um, our, our principals and our staff are being very intentional right now of focusing on relationships that Lynn mentioned as part of our health and well-being work. So for example, um, our, a number of our schools are making sure that every one of our students can report out that they have at least one trusted adult that they can go to in our schools if they need it. Right, that's part of that universe. We want all kids to know that they have got someone in house that they can go to if they need assistance. Um, the targeted, the second tier here is these might be for students who have some risk. So let's say there are some students who are struggling in reading or in math. We've just hired some additional math interventionists, for example, with the help of Bainbridge Schools Foundation to provide kind of more rapid response for kids at the elementary school level, for example, who are behind in math, right? Not all kids need that, but some do, right? And so we want to make sure that we're being really proactive um, in that. And then the third, the tip of the pyramid is really more for students that are at high risk. So for example, there may be students who need more intensive services. Maybe they need wraparound services with our community partners like Helpline House or Bainbridge Youth Services. Maybe they need some counseling support. Um, and so, you know, the, the one thing I really want to emphasize here is it's not as if our teachers and staff have not been doing this. You know, we've been trying to connect our students to what they need for, for many years or partnering with our organizations to help us do that. But what I would say is that MTSS and what we're trying to do now, particularly coming out of COVID, is being much, much more um, intentional and bringing more rigor to the, this work as a system. So we are being more intentional about building out, kind of using our data to identify what each student needs, whether that's in math or behavioral health supports or basic needs and so on. We have a lot of you know, team meetings happening to kind of look at what kids need, look, what does the data show, what, what are we learning about our interactions with different students, um, having better communication and coordination with our families so that we know what their needs are. And then there's a lot of monitoring, assessing, like, okay, what's working? What, what do we need to adjust? Um, how, do we, how do we provide better supports for, for, for each of the students? Do you, what are you, oh, I was just going to say that I, I know that good teachers from time immemorial have had this kind of engagement, but uh, as our society gets more complex, as the challenges of academics increase and uh, so forth, I'm guessing that uh, expecting teachers to do that on their own is really not fair. Um, I'm wondering if part of uh, MTSS is a uh, sort of uh, commitment by um, the administration and by other parts of the school district to uh, sort of respond to red flags or, um, or, or, or alarms or even just requests from a classroom or other uh, staff person. Yeah, absolutely. That and also um, making it more... Uh, Making having us work as a system more across the whole district, so that, for example, um, the the interventions that might really support uh, readers, let's say in an elementary school, that what we're doing at Blakely is similar to what we're doing at Wilkes, or that the data that we are, um, you know, what we're learning about um, our students from a behavioral health perspective, from a an academic perspective that that's sort of that we can look at it whole, right? Versus just looking at our math scores or just looking at um, one portion, one part of the kids' lives. And so we're trying to just be more intentional about pulling it all together and having it be system-wide and not 
not just relying on, um, and also I think providing more supports and uh, to our teachers and staff with our students that there are resources or there are things that we're doing across the system that they can access um, to help support students. Is that fair, Lynn? Would you? Yeah, and I, I, I just want to really stress that um, a lot of these supports are things they they will look at some data or they'll see a kid that seems to be uh, not doing well on fractions, and so they bring in an interventionist that will help this kid learn fractions, and then the kid gets to you know doesn't lose any classroom time because they're doing this as a pullout and they're not falling behind, but they're learning they're building that skill, you know, immediately to the point where they could, they will know their fractions in two weeks. It's, we used to, when we do it, did interventions like that, like reading, it would be like a six week process. And this is like a very targeted, let's get them caught up and teach them what they need to know and, and then let them thrive, right? And so I just, I, that's what I love about this whole system is it's so targeted. The kids don't feel like they're being pulled out for any bad reason, like there's something wrong with them. It's a support to get them caught up. And so I just I just think it's a wonderful, it's a huge undertaking, but um, it just shows that our, that, you know, our belief in these kids and that they just need a little step, you know, a little help to get them up with their classmates. So Lynn, were you talking about the Read Now program? Um, actually, no, I was sort of talking at a higher level than that. Um, I don't actually, unfortunately don't know about that program. So. Is, is it Read Now? I'm trying to think what, I volunteered over at Wilkes and um, and uh, uh, for the Read Now program and had uh, two or three students that I worked with on a weekly basis. Oh, right. Was is it part of the Rotary Read Now thing? Or for it the might have been. What was the name? What's the name of the program? I thought it was Read Now, but not maybe. Yeah, and that's really that's that's one of the one of the systems of support that we have. You know, there's many. Yeah, it many was different. it was during during school hours. When yeah. I was Love that, you know, and then that's how we can we can you know use our community partnerships to just make the kids more comfortable with reading, right? All right, mm -hmm. great thank program. You. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for volunteering. <laughs> um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of how our uh, district approved plan is weaving through both our curriculum, both how we're trying to provide supports for various students. Um, uh, or all students in various ways. I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn to talk about our safety preparedness because that is also a key part of our district improvement plan. It is, we've been just getting prepared and prepared. <laughs> it's actually, you know, given given the, the, the culture out there right now, safety is very high on people's minds. Um, but we really, so we're taking these steps, you know, that are sort of hard, I don't want to say we're hardening our schools, but we're, you know, putting in cameras and we're taking care of student safety that way. But what we're really, really focusing on is belonging and building relationships with our kids. That is the first place where we see where there's going to be a problem security wise. Um, so we uh, are, as like our dip says, we, we are, um, focusing on social emotional learning, belonging. Um, we have decided, we made the decision as a district to spend more money on counselors and psychologists and social workers and nurses, which are not necessarily paid for by the state. So we thank our community for um, using our levy dollars to help pay for the student safety and security. Um, we also are empowering our, our students to, to stand up for themselves and report something if they see something. And it's really, there's a button on our website that they can go and it can be anonymous, can be where they can do it. And it just gives them the opportunity to see something, to say something if they see something. And it's actually really come in handy. We monitor it closely and um, has saved some situations from happening. So we really, I think that's a very powerful tool, <laughs> tool for our students to be empowered with. Um, and we're also um, always refining our processes on how to deal with threat assessments, which a threat assessment would be um, it's like we, uh, a student we see is starting to show signs of something happening. And so there's a process that we go through and we refine it to, um, to help that student see what's wrong, see how we can, we can help that student maybe change what they're going to do. It's, um, it's a really big deal and it's a lot of hours and time, but it's it's worth it if we can save one student. So um, that is what we're doing for safety. There's just so much and it's so big 
but um, but I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. Well, and it's obviously something that all kinds of community organizations uh, are thinking about. It's uh, there's a lot of uh, scary news in the world, and um, and we have to be prepared for uh, how to respond. So that's that's good work by the district. If you're just joining or can't remember, I think DIP or DIP is the District Improvement Program. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Reed. So I think we just want to kind of summarize then and be responsive, Reed, to one of your earlier questions of kind of what are what do we have on the horizon? What are some of the challenges and strengths of, of uh, the district right now? And um, so Lynn and I are just going to tag team this. Um, I would say you've heard quite a few of our current projects or things that are underway. Definitely um, make sure we have the right sports for the right kids at the right time doing all those new curriculum adoptions, because once we adopt it, there's still a lot of work around implementation that our teachers are, are in, invested in. Um, we do have a district budget advisory committee that is underway right now. Um, and I would guess I would summarize the, from a budget perspective that we are in a strong financial position for this current school year, but we will need to make reductions in, in, in the upcoming school year on, based on our current trajectory. And that's, um, as Lynn mentioned, both due to declining enrollment as well as um, insufficient state funding. And we can talk more about that um, if, if there's interest. But I think at a, at a high level, we, are, we, are, we graduate more students than we have coming in in, in kindergarten. And over time, that creates um, a very significant uh, um, enrollment um, challenge. Um, and likewise, the, the, there's a gap between what the state funds and what our actual costs are. So we have a whole team working on that right now. We also put out a survey to our community staff and students to help us think that through and how to prioritize going into this next budget. Um, Lynn talked about the safety areas of focus. Um, and then you've probably also heard a lot of improvements around or seen if you've gone up to the high school, the new track, the new turf up there, and then we're um, upgrading the fast pitch in the baseball fields. And then you may have also heard that um, there's a committee, a community wide committee looking at renaming Wilkes Elementary School. So let me um, turn it over to you, Lynn. Do you want to do the, the next part? Yeah, well, um, and uh, going forward, we're it, it's We've just finished building a bunch of buildings, as you know. Thank you. Um, so we're working on our comprehensive capital plan, which is basically a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, actually, of what to do with our buildings as we move forward. Um, we're looking at uh, rebuilding Ordway and Commodore and the district office. Um, and there's lots of plans going on about that. It will be a huge community conversation, but I just want to warn people that it's coming. Um, and we are also uh, uh, have some levies that will be coming forward, you know, over the next few years. I think they're every three or four years. So um, for technology and um, programs and operations, which helps fund teachers, curriculum, and all the things that our community act values, you know, locally. Um, I have some slides for taxes. I don't know if you have an interest in hearing about taxes. What do you think, Reed? Well, uh, why don't we dive in there and see what uh, <laughs> what it looks like? Okay, yeah, because I am like not a tax expert, but mm -hmm. um, but I thought that I would at least um, point out um, if you looked at your tax bill over you know for the last year, um, there's a lot of things on there that say school district on it or school. And so I just wanted to um, point out this um, that we have some bonds and levies that are you know that are, we've all voted in. But I wanted to point out that the green portion of the pie chart is what we get from the state. That is, um, and that includes the if you look on the right, the state school part one and part two. That's money that the state taxes us that they put into a huge fund and they send out to the schools, right? And then the yellow part is what our wonderful taxpayers pay directly to our schools. Um, so it's just, you know, we. I'm so happy that we value education in our state and in our local communities. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I think it will break down into, it's just a, a thought about our general fund, which our general fund is what pays for teachers, curriculum. It does not pay for buildings or any of that, those sorts of things. So it's all about students. It's student-focused um, funding. And um, 
So we as a school district have decided that 87% of our general fund goes to staff salaries and benefits because we really believe that our teachers are our strongest asset for our students, right? And if you look at the blue part of this, um, only 74.3% of our general fund comes from the state to pay for teachers. So there's a, there's, there's a gap there. And, and so um, we've been cutting into the pink part of this pie, the levy, enrichment levy, to help pay for our teachers. So there's just, it's showing as, as we move forward each year, that gap is getting bigger and bigger. And so in order, so that's why we're talking about next year, we're gonna be having a more of a gap. So we're gonna actually have to perhaps lay off some teachers. We have to reorganize how things are going and adjust for enrollment, but still the, the gap is growing. And so there is a problem on the horizon for the school district budget. Does that explain it okay? Yeah, well, that's very important to note. So I'm yeah. glad that we get there because the, yeah, you mentioned at the top about the idea that uh, we have decreasing enrollment, even mm -hmm. as we uh, want to maintain an uh, excellent school system and, um, and we have support, but we're going to have to keep rethinking this. Also, we have uh, a lot of different ideas about <coughs> um, education. Mm -hmm. I know that we have a lot of, uh, uh, private schools, especially um, at the younger ages here. And I know that uh, the school district has been participating in alternatives through uh, through the Commodore and, and alternative programs. Uh, but um, we kind of have to hold all those things in, in balance, right? And that's that's your job as uh, school board members to help us try to figure out how to how to at least prioritize those because those of us who are not as involved uh, depend on you to both think those things through and then articulate your thoughts, so. Yeah, yeah, and it's a hard thing to articulate, right? <laughs> Taxes are difficult, but I mean, I think I think we wanna be completely transparent that we are good stewards, stewards of our taxpayer money, but we're getting less and less. You know, we try to budget to enrollment, but we don't know what our enrollment is before we budget. So we're stuck in this rock in a hard place kind of thing where we guess right. a lot. <laughs> and that's and that's pretty much true of a lot of budgeting, but uh, but you have a large budget and you have a lot of people who depend on it. And I, I believe yes. you're the largest employer. We are. That's right. Uh, on, on, <laughs> in the island. So uh, yeah. you represent a big part of our community that way too. Uh, you talked earlier, if you don't mind me jumping to another question. Sure. <laughs> about um, academic pressure. Well, I guess what you were talking about was high expectations. And yeah. having had a couple of kids go through the school district, I, rec I recognize that uh, sometimes that high expectation, either from the community or from the school, can, uh, can be translated in a person's psyche as academic pressure. And yeah. obviously, we don't want to uh, have less than high expectations for our kids. Uh, but when you talk about all the different kinds of goals that children may develop over the course of their years. We don't have a track system like the like they do in in uh, in the UK. Um, we ask people to make those decisions as they go about what they see coming out of uh, high school, what, what their next thing is going to be. Mm -hmm. That's got to be a big challenge for a um, school district like this, where there are a lot of uh, at least public expectations of glorious paths to Ivy League schools and so forth. Mm. Any thoughts on on how on how high expectations uh, can mean something besides simply academic achievement? Do you want to field yeah. that one, Christina? Sure. I mean, I, I look about it in terms of um, both as a parent of two young kids and then also in my school board role, it's not high for me. It's you know I have we have high hopes for each of our students and a belief in their individual abilities to to um, to contribute in ways that that kind of fit who they are and their skills and their passions and their knowledge. That may not be a four year college, um, and I think that that we've also been. Um, and so I want to elevate that. And, and I look at each of our students and say, there's gold in each student <laughs> um, that we want to make sure they can bring out, right? And in whatever it is they choose to do. 
It's also why um, we've been very intentional as a school district about um, broadening the amount that we offer for our career and technical education program. So we have over 60 classes now that are in all different tracks um, that may or may not be a four-year college track, um, but that is intended to give students a lot of options for different, different areas they might be interested in exploring or different career paths or, um, and all of that is, is beautiful. It's wonderful, right? And, and we need that as a society. So, so, you know, that's one thought I have, Reed, as you're bringing up that question. The other one is, you know, in previous years, you know, before this district improvement plan, um, I would, you know, here's what I say, this district improvement plan has much more, in my view, balance between the academic side and the social emotional health side, which has been very, very intentional. So when we say at a high level, we believe in the health and well-being of our students alongside their academics, that is a, an a intentional <laughs> statement about um, about you know having high expectations and um, and making sure we're we're helping support the whole child and that it's not just about the math scores from the state. Yeah, and I I can just jump in having um, two recent graduates um, kind of being on the other end of the of the spectrum from Christina with her young kids. Um, there is I think it's more of a community based. It's it's a communication piece we need to do with our community about where these kids are going. Both of my kids came up through the alternative schools, through Commodore, and, you know, it went to colleges that were where they could be passionate, they could follow their passions. You know, one's going to be a math teacher and one wants to go into theater. And so they got to go to, but there's a lot of pressure to, to go to an Ivy League or go to Stanford or whatever. And I think a lot of that comes from parents because that's what we did. But I think it's a community communication piece that we need to work on. It's a lot of stress for our kids and it shows that, you know, they are unable to, not unable, but they, there are expectations that are put on them that, so uh, like the CTE stuff and having them able to actually take some of these classes and see if their passions are really their passions and their parents get to see them thriving in these places. And so, you know. CT, CTE. Yes, yes. And we're actually, we have a what's, slide what's... on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I took your slides away. Oh, it's fine. It's um, it's um, career. It's fine. It's career and technical information. Oh, uh, education. Education. Okay. So, um, and it was kind of going into my tax thing that um, you know, our last bond paid for the 100 building up at the high school, and that is, if you ever get a chance to go into a building, that is the building to go into because it is all of our CTE programs put together. Um, and if you look at the picture on the um, right hand side, that's like the commons area. And it's just it's like a giant makerspace. It's just it's got art. It's got computer science. It's got culinary arts, which is used to be home ec, right They're back in our day. And now the kids are learning how to navigate a commercial kitchen or run a restaurant. Um, so if we, we've taken the, these core things, you know, a lot of people say, why don't we have auto shop anymore? You know, cause darn it. Cause it's really not cost effective to have auto shop, but we put partnerships together where our kids are interning with mechanics or they're learning how to run computers that run cars. And so it's a, it's a different, it's a different approach to the same thing. And, you know, so our kids are getting this awesome opportunity to try these classes out, you know, and see if that's what they want. And it's, it's, I just think it's incredible. Like the, the picture on the um, bottom right is, is the light grid above the new theater where our tech kids can go up there. You can't fall through. It's a little weird walking on there. Cause I've done that, <laughs> but, um, but they learn how to do all this light rigging and everything in a safe place. And so it's just, I, in case you couldn't tell, I'm a little excited about this, <laughs> but that's what, you know, that's what we're going towards is this, um, this balance of these kids being able to really find their passions and follow them. Yeah. And what you were talking about earlier about real life experience with math, uh, figuring out exactly how to put together the right light grid or whatever is yeah. going to have to get out your calculator to help you with that a little bit. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> I'm a graphic designer and I use fractions every day. <laughs> Well, and a really good example of that is one out of our CTE program um, here recently, students were building tiny homes 
more affordable homes um, in partnership with other community organizations. Um, so it was both, you know, help, it was giving them a lot of skills, right, in, in, in that, as well as being of service, because those, you know, that home was going to be used um, for low-income housing. Um, and so it's, it's been, that's been really fun to see. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that was through, you know, wood shop, right. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that was another good example of a community partnership. So, so we did talk earlier about um, the idea of uh, checking out the website and there's information on uh, BISD 303. Is that right? Yeah. Dot org. Yep. Yep. And um, and also, are there other things that I could do? Obviously, here we have the school board meetings. Uh, yeah. Certainly, we should attend those. Um, uh, but but They're on short of that, are there other ways we can keep keep in touch about what's going on? Yeah, I mean, there's many ways. There's um, you know, we have some of them listed here. Um, we have our newsletter. Uh, you can certainly come to school board meetings or or watch them. Welcome that. There's many, but I would also say you know probably. Uh, where there's where we have a lot of interest is in volunteering in our schools. So there's a, um, a website here where you can do that. Um, and then just to put a plug, we are always looking for substitutes and we have a number of positions open. So if that is of any interest to, to someone listening today, we would um, welcome you to come join our team. Uh, that's that's been actually a critical component of our ability to have, to stay open over through COVID, um, especially this last year. So. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of different opportunities, and I think we would just want to close by saying we appreciate you. <laughs> um, it is, you know, everyone here who's listening or who who is watching this later, um, you are part of supporting our schools um, with your time, your care, your resources, and it makes a difference. I think this community is what helps our school district go from good to great, and we've been very, very, very lucky and appreciative um, of all the support from from you and from from the island um, as a whole.